Welcome to National Vocation Fashion Week. Today's episode is joined by Dawn Hausman from the Diocese of Lansing. She is the Director of Consecrated Vocations there in her diocese. So welcome, Dawn. Thank you. Thank you for, for having me, Krista. So Dawn is a consecrated virgin in her diocese. Um, and consecrated virginity is a, a very old vocation in the church. In my home diocese, there's actually a few consecrated virgins. And I just went to my friend's consecration this past June. It's very beautiful. And maybe we can even just the starting point of this conversation be religious life, secular institutes, and consecrated virginity. What are the ma major differences there? Yeah, you know, walking with women in the discovery of their vocation, I usually say, you know, a few basic things of like, if you're trying to grapple with, you know, Jesus, what is my vocation, which one of these, I think I'm called a consecrated life. And sometimes I don't know how to sort this all out. There's a lot, right? <laughs> There's like tons of religious orders and tons, you know, one thing I tell them about the difference, for instance, between consecrated virginity and religious life is, you know, the communal piece this vocation is consecrated virgin, um, we have no guarantee of community, right? So there's this aspect that, and I'll speak from like a, a perspective of being one, is many of us feel that this, this vocation is lived intimately, deeply, almost like we need a certain amount of solitude with God <laughs> to therefore go in the world, to be a part of the world, to bring him to the world really discerning through that communal life piece is a huge aspect of a difference of what religious sisters live as they live in community and pray and eat and have a common mission and apostolate um, charism. Consecrated virgins, our main charism is being a witness of the bridal image that all of us are um, as church before the divine bridegroom. We are the bride before the divine bridegrooms. In her singularity with the Lord, her bridal uh, image is what the Lord uses to say, okay, this is how all of us are going to be when we get to the kingdom, espoused to, to Jesus. So um, we kind of live that alone. I mean, we can live together. We can live with other women, of course. Many times we find solitude a big part of our vocation. So sensing that that spirituality of like, alone with the Lord in the world. Um, and then the calling to be in the world. So in a sense, religious life, when you see orders wearing habits, you're seeing that even if they are working or ministering in the world, they're separated from the world by their habit. But, you know, they belong to the Lord. People know that by the sight of them. For consecrated virgins, we live in the world. Part of our bringing Christ to the world is to look like everyone else. I kind of say we're kind of incognito brides of Christ. We're hidden nuns in the world, <laughs> even though really not nuns, but we kind of can have that way of affecting, bringing Jesus to secular places. Um, it's kind of affecting the world by his love, which kind of relates to secular institutes, right? That they're the leaven in the world. They're like a hidden leaven. I sometimes think they live their, their consecration or their vows a little bit more like hidden consecrated virginity is kind of like we still live a public witness of this vocation but secular institutes women who are or men or who are living in secular institutes sometimes live a little bit more of a deeper hiddenness of their mm -hmm. vocation in the world in in that that calling and sometimes they live communally right and sometimes they don't in secular institutes but consecrated virgins many of us live alone but i think a lot of us felt the sense i'm not supposed to leave the world of course, I'm not supposed to be of it, but I'm not supposed to leave it either. Like I'm supposed to bring Jesus, be the presence of Jesus to the world and be a witness of the bride of Christ, being a bride of Christ. My friend, Emily, who is a consecrated virgin in my home diocese, she made a movie review. She wrote something, she published it on maybe her blog or website. And on the bottom, she said, I'm a consecrated virgin. My grandmother calls me a uh, freelance nun, <laughs> which nice. I think I think is a funny way of putting it. I understand what she means by that, what her grandmother means by that. I'm starting to understand too the difference between secular institutes and consecrated virginity. Uh, I've heard it in, in other podcasts about um, the hiddenness. Uh, like sometimes people say, "Oh, consecrated virginity, you're so hidden," and people will correct and say, "No, it's very, it's public. It's very public. It's open to the whole." diocese the consecration that I went to was in the cathedral of our diocese so it's very much open to the whole church kind of the way um 
an ordination is. And yeah. my understanding of the vocation is that it is uh, like it's to serve the local church. So, and maybe you can correct me if my understanding no, of it is wrong, but I think it feels like a, a parallel to diocesan priesthood. It's very likened. Yeah. Like I feel like a kindred uh, sister in, uh, to our brother priests, you know, that the, the diocesan priesthood, very similar in the way that they live out their spiritual fatherhood. Um, we kind of live out that spiritual motherhood within our diocese under the guidance of Bishop kind of in a stable place and yeah, kind of like the freelance mode of <laughs> I'm kind of for everyone here. I'm a spiritual mother to everyone in the diocese, essentially, even though I'm not always ministering directly to, to everyone, but. You work at the diocese and you work in the vocations office, but mm -hmm. other consecrated virgins don't necessarily have to do that. Right. Yeah. We can have various jobs, right? So there's some who are working in hospitals as nurses some who are administrative assistants for people, some who are, yeah, teachers, principals, accountants, you know, there's a whole variety. I, I knew a missionary, a missionary nurse, and, a, and she's a consecrated virgin. So there's a whole variety of things we can do. But many of us do end up working in the church, but it's not like a prerequisite. You don't have to work for the church. <laughs> I actually heard of a consecrated virgin who was the administrative assistant of a bishop. And when he got moved diocese, she moved, she like moved with him. She stayed. Oh, wow. The consecrated virgins that I know, if they don't work in the church, like, like at a parish or in the diocese, they, or in a Catholic school, they still are very active in their parish or um, what have you. So mm -hmm. I, I do, I do see it in my mind as a parallel to diocesan priesthood, also called the secular priesthood. So that also um, differs from what you're saying, religious life, the separation in, in living in the, the state of life and how you, how you live. So um, thank you for those differentiations and that, that clarification there. So in our last episodes uh, of the week, since you're the last one of the week, we've previously gone into talking about particular habits of the community or the congregation. But since you don't wear a habit, I think it'd be great to talk about um, what you wear in your mass of consecration. So I know you said you were going to share your screen. Dawn, I just wanted you to have the opportunity to talk about what you wear in the mass of consecration. Um, because I went to my friends back in, in June of this year, and it was so beautiful. I think more people need to, to have a visual element to this. <laughs> sure, sure. Happy to share. I, can you see this? I can see it. Okay, so this is my consecration day, and um, if none of you have been to a consecration, um, it's certainly a beautiful uh, liturgy that people can say it's a combination of like a wedding and almost as if you're at like a diocesan ordination kind of thing. There's like a mixture of things like prostration happens, mm -hmm. um, the bishop has a consecratory prayer because we don't take vows, but we we take a promise of living a life of perpetual virginity. And the bishop, he bestows a particular blessing upon us. So instead of like me expressing vows, he's actually consecrating me on behalf of the Lord Jesus um, to set me apart as a sacramental, right? As a bride of Christ, an image of that in the world. So on this day of consecration, what I'm wearing is a wedding dress because any woman who's getting married would wear a wedding dress. And um, I also had a lamp. I just want to show you real quickly. Just the lamp there is, a, it signifies the wise virgins. So when there were like the 10 virgins, only five were wise. The story goes that, or the scripture passage goes that the, the wise virgins had extra oil because they were awaiting the bridegroom's return. And um, this is such a beautiful imagery because, yeah, like, when is the bridegroom going to come for me? When is the bridegroom going to come for all of us? We have to be ready and we have to be ready to wait. Many times it takes a while to wait for your vocation. Anyway, so there I am in a wedding dress. My attendants are beside me. Um, my friend Karen, she's actually one of the consecrated virgins in the Archdiocese of Detroit. And a friend of mine, Elizabeth, right next to her. Um, so wearing a wedding dress prostration and um, the consecratory prayer. The liturgy happens, or the, the insignia here is a veil 
that the bishop puts on me on behalf of Jesus, right? He, he is showing that he's wedding me to Christ, that I'm now set apart for him in a particular way as his bride. Um, so he, he veiled me. And then he also put a ring on my finger, which is really the main um, outward symbol that we wear at all times, right? Our ring symbol of being wedded to Jesus. And he gave me the liturgy of the hours. So that's him giving me, handing me the liturgy of the hours, essentially saying, I don't know the exact words. So um, pray with the church for the church, for the salvation of the world, right? It's um, the ask that I'm in prayer with the church for the salvation of the world. So those were the three insignia, the veil, the ring, and the liturgy of the hours, the prayer book of the church. So yeah, that, that's that's so beautiful. People sometimes will say, um, oh, so she's a consecrated single. And and I think that the if you're going to be precise, the answer is no, she's not a consecrated single. Um, right. for consecrated virginity, this this kind of exhibits is very much as you said earlier, bridal imagery. Mm -hmm. Um you're you're married it's not yes. it's not being a single person it's being a married person and that person that you're married to is jesus christ so i do think it's important to especially for this episode for vocation week to talk about the fact that you are a bride so in other conversations we've kind of talked about specifically charisms of communities and and even the secular institutes kind of has a spirituality and a charism of sorts but how would you describe that for consecrated virginity and how is that different than like a, a religious community's charism? Yeah, it's interesting because as you said, this is like an ancient vocation, but a new vocation. <laughs> so it, this rite was restored in the 70s in Vatican II, but in ancient of days, you know, all those beautiful early virgin saints of the church who we say in the liturgy many of times, um, St. Agnes, St. Cecilia, St. Lucy, we have all these feminine figures that became brides of Christ, these women who knew that they were supposed to be espoused to the Lord. They were set apart uh, for him. They dedicated them, their whole selves, their virginity, their life, their wholeness to the Lord outside of a community. And there, there were no communities, right? You know, we have our early image of these women living in the midst of the world, some of them, many of them living with their families, like just among their regular society, but making some kind of vow, some kind of commitment in various ways, I'm sure at that time, to the Lord, to be to belong solely to the Lord. And that was very unique for their time. But communities started, and that's beautiful. Like many, many came together. But eventually the church recognized there are women who are still called to live, not in a community, but in a solitary form. And like a, I kind of call myself half hermit, half social butterfly. Like it's definitely not a running away from community. It's like living a marriage. Married couples don't live with each other, like other married couples, <laughs> you know? And yeah. I feel that the way that the Lord had called me, it was kind of to be espoused to him like alone with him in the world mm -hmm. and, um, and therefore also have grace to serve his people in various ways, but to really live that spousal imagery. And then that the particular charism of a country virgin is usually bridal, intimately spousal in a solitary way in the world. Um, those are kind of the terms and it's kind of like right in the title too, of a woman consecrated to a life of virginity living in the world. Yeah. I think it's, it's, just the most important witness that we live is that gift of I'm trying to show you and the rest of the world what is to come for all of us. And this relationship that I have with Jesus, it's not just for me. Like you're meant to also live that too. Like everyone, we can live this intimately and united with the Lord. And so we're kind of to be an icon of that, um, embodying what the church is meant to be before God a receptive bride and joyfully in love with him in this marriage, because this is the greatest form of marriage, even though we all naturally long for the natural marriage. It's part of the human makeup of the body and how God made us. Um, but this is like a calling out of that, that call that's most natural to us 
to point to the heavenly marriage and to embody that as a ch- as the church. You're bringing up the this phrase that I read about when I was reading about this vocation. If the priesthood is kind of in persona Christi or in the person of Christ, a consecrated virgin is in persona ecclesia, in the person of the church. Consecrated virgin is meant to be the church, is meant to be the bride of Christ. And mm-hmm. uh, the way that's personified or the way, you know, there's a sacramental element of it in the sense that you live it, the bride of Christ, like you said, has to have that intimate relationship, just like a husband, a natural husband and wife, they know each other and they know each other intimately and they get to know each other deeply, probably over time, especially. Let me think how I want to ask this. What's it like to, to live in persona ecclesia? What does that look like in the way that you encounter people? Another thing that I think about consecrated virginity is that the priesthood is the heart of Christ in the world and Mm -hmm. really all men are called to be the heart of Christ in the world Um, but the women are and maybe particularly in a way consecrated virgins are the heart of Mary in the world and especially Mm -hmm. I mean she's virgin of virgins Mm -hmm. um, and she's virgin par excellence right so what what's it like to be the heart of the church Mm -hmm. or the in persona Ecclesia and the heart of Mary in the world. Yeah. Can I give you a cool example of like a church reality of that? Like a a churchy reality. I was moments before my consecration, I went on a retreat, like a short three or four day retreat, um, a weekend or two before I was getting consecrated. And I'm totally preparing for consecration. I'm reading through the right. I'm just delighting in the right of consecration. And there's a priest who's not in his normal attire who's retreating to on the same, in the same grounds. And I didn't, so I didn't know it was a, who he was a priest. And he came up to me, we were both sitting in the chapel at some point and he came up to me and he was like, excuse me, do you mind? I'm getting ready to leave this retreat. And I would like to celebrate mass before I go. Um, is that okay? Would you mind if I did that? And I was like, no, would you mind if I be a part of the mass? <laughs> Cause I didn't have mass that day. There was no mass on the grounds. And so it was a gift to me. And he said, sure, you know, so he goes down to, to, we were, it was like a loft area. So he goes down to celebrate mass. I go down and he's celebrating the mass. And it was such a beautiful gift from God that he's saying all the priestly parts. He's standing in the person of the priest and there's no one else but me sitting there saying all the church's parts. Right. And he didn't even say any of those, like the, the responses, he just let me say them all. And it was super precious because it just showed that um, even as a consecrated virgin, even though I look like people could say, oh, this is like the feminist at best, right? Like she doesn't need a man. It's like, no, I actually do need a man. I need that priest right up there right now. And our church embodies such a reality that I can't do without the priest and what he gives in the person of Christ. And they can't do without us. They can't do without me, right? The church who they are meant to be giving their lives for, right? Just as Jesus did. And so it was just kind of like a moment where the Lord just let me delight in what I was becoming in the church, but also what does that mean in the world too? And just the witness that we live. So I love to give that example, just to give that, you know, the place we, we all have in the church that is irreplaceable um, and the feminine genius and the masculine genius. I find that me living as a bride of Christ, when I'm living it well, <laughs> Um, it really does bless people around me who um, just see the joy of a bride of Christ, someone who like actually is just living a great love life with the Lord, but also uh, in service to his church too, Uh, getting to be a spiritual mother to the women I walk with in discernment and especially to them. They're they're my main um, spiritual daughters at this point of my life. And then, of course, I have many spiritual children who are like God, sons and daughters in my life, too, of course, and and just a lot of other families and friends. But it's so interesting how there's a silent it's it's a humble. Silent presence of when I'm living amongst families and friends. My witness of just living what I am it just does something to people. Like, I don't necessarily even know what it's doing, but um, it reminds people of God is real 
and this woman could be having her own husband and children, but she's living a witness in her body of giving that up, forfeiting that, foregoing that for to remind us all of what's coming in the kingdom that is a great gift worth worth waiting for, worth giving life for, you know? It's a silent witness though. It's very quiet. I've had a lot of people in the world be surprised when they found out, oh my gosh, you're like, you know, secular people who, if I get into a deep enough conversation to let them know I'm a consecrated virgin and I have various ways of describing, you know, yeah, I'm so I'm vowed to Jesus. I'm vowed to God, like as if espoused to him, as espoused to him. So I'm not going to have my own husband and children. So I'm not like available to date or anything like that, you know, and people have been very respectful and even like very secular people have been very respectful of like the mystery of it and kind of silently in awe of it. Prophetic witness, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Prophetic witness in the sense that you're, you're telling the truth, right? That God wants to marry his people. God wants to espouse us, which I think a lot of us have our, have some sort of woman at the well moment where we realize that that's the beauty of this vocation too, is that your brideship has a fruitfulness element to it. And like you said, having many spiritual children and helping people with their vocation too. This is something that I want to ask too, is like, what do you think the role of the Holy Spirit is? Um, Because charisms are a gift from the Holy Spirit, right? So what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the consecrated virgin? Uh, living in the world and ministering. I don't know who said it first. I'm sorry. I don't know who said it first, but basically Mary is the the created immaculate conception. Mm-hmm. So when she- Maximilian is, Colby, I think. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> She's the created immaculate conception and she takes the name of her spouse, the Holy Spirit. And he's the Holy Spirit, the uncreated immaculate conception. What do you think? <laughs> this is such a long way to ask this question, but what do you think is- the role of the Holy Spirit in your vocation. I know that in consecrated virginity, there's so much need for us to be very attuned, just like all of us as Christians, of what God is actually asking of us. Mm -hmm. I don't have religious sisters in my home to tell me, okay, you're a little off, (laughs) Dawn. You know, we all definitely need the Holy Spirit to guide us in various ways, but I think there's a real importance that the consecrated virgin strongly leans in, learns how to hear the voice of the spirit. I mean, to, to do anything like I didn't buy a house without the Holy spirit. I I just really was asking the Lord, is it time for me to, to move out of our woman's discernment household that I was living in and mentoring the women in for six years to then own my own house? I never even lived alone. I was 37 years old (laughs) and I made a leap from never living alone to buying my house, my own house, but it just felt like the right time. I prayed about it a while. I discerned it with the Holy Spirit. I discerned the house with the Holy Spirit too. I just really sensed that this is the one. Like I felt like, oh, I could make this one work. I could make this one work. Then when I stepped in a, a particular house, just send such a piece of the Holy Spirit to say this house we can pray in, we can live in. Um, And I think that is like key because if we don't, we don't live as a spouse to God and be asking what he wants us to do day in, day out, what job he wants us to take. um, We're going to live as if we're single in, in a sense of a, not just every single person, but someone who's not even paying any attention to another, like Mm. God leading us. Um, Sometimes we can feel like I can do whatever I want with my life. But as a contrary version, I feel like it's a really important, responsible thing of us to say, I want to help lead the church to see how to respond to the Holy Spirit's prompting in all things as best as I can, as best as I humanly can, because I'm not Mary and I'm not perfect (laughs) to really exercise that um, life in the spirit to really depend on, is it time to get a new job? Um, You know, is there a restlessness here that I need to be sensitive to something new coming up or 
but to really be leaning into that. Sometimes I'll stand in front of my closet and be like, Jesus, what do you want me to wear today? Holy Spirit, what do you want me to <laughs> And um, to try to like live that life in union and tune with, with what the Spirit is asking. Of course, to hear the vocation, but also just in these little responses. And of course, we have spiritual directors to help us in the journey too, but they're supposed to help us hear what the Holy Spirit is doing in us sure. to be able yeah. to respond accordingly. So the more that we grow in understanding the sensitivity of the spirit's work in us, the more we'll be able to respond to his promptings in, in all things. There's always more to learn and there's always new ways. At a certain point in my journey, I started recognizing God speaking to me through songs, you know, or just sensing a little bit, a deeper peace in one decision versus another. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's essentially living accountable to another who wants to be participating in all my decisions, you know? Um, not always good at doing it, but I think it's super important in, in our way of life because I don't have a mother superior helping me hear the voice of the Lord directing me in any way. Um, it's that much more essential that we work to hear the voice of the, the spirit and along with the spiritual director's help, along with friends help who, who are, who can also help us hear what God's doing in our lives so what I'm hearing is um like Mary when I think of Mary's relationship with the Trinity you know she was like a handmaid first she was the the beloved handmaid of the father it's a Trinity so they're like outside mm -hmm. of time or whatever but then she was you know the spouse of the Holy Spirit and then the mother of the son and so her relationship with the Trinity is so perfect but also particular to each one of them and child mother and bride are there in the the Marian role what you're saying I'm kind of hearing those elements too is that there is there's a belovedness that you have to live out as a child and a spouse and to mother the church mm -hmm. thank you for for those things so can you tell us more about how do consecrated virgins live you said you you received the liturgy of the hours can you talk more about some things that are particular to consecrated virginity and maybe things that are just particular to you. There's not a ton of strict rules for the prayer life that we have for consecrated virginity. We have some, some guidelines. I'll just tell you about my day and then I'll kind of specifically say what, what those guidelines are. But I usually start my day with a holy hour before I leave my house. So if everything's, um, you know, in my usual routine, I will get up in the morning an hour before anything else and just have a cup of coffee with the Lord. It's not, it's not always in every diocese, but my Bishop has allowed us to have the blessed sacrament in our home. So I have an hour with the Lord before I leave my house. And sometime in my day, I usually get to mass unless it's not possible. We have daily mass here at the cathedral and it's like right next door to the diocesan offices. So we just walk down at noon or if there's another time of the day that works better, I'll go somewhere else. Um, but I just think it's vital to like, okay, I, I need to receive the bridegroom into my body every day, like to be transformed into his person, to be united in his person, to be, you know, have that intimate spousal union. So usually my basics of like bare bones is like the liturgy of the hours. If I'm on vacation with family, the liturgy of the hours and mass. Um, I do pray five, the five hours of the day. So I'll pray the office of readings, morning prayer, midday prayer at some point of the day, evening prayer and night prayer. I think if, if we look at the strict rules, the basic ask is that we pray the office, but if, if we can't get to all the office, morning and evening prayer are the essentials. So we're praying with the church for the church in those two hours, at least. Um, but I think a lot of us try to strive for the five hours. Sometimes I'll get an extra holy hour. Usually I'll get a holy hour on a walk. <laughs> Many times I go on a walk after work. If I have time, I'll I'll spend an hour just chatting with the Lord, praying a rosary. We're supposed to have a Marian devotion. So um, many times that looks like a rosary and other times it can literally be a dialogue with Mary, a asking for intercession. It can certainly look various, various ways. Um, but many times the easiest thing that we can do is to pray a rosary, you know, to have that um, devotion with Mary. This church asks that we have a devotion to Mary, be women of the scripture, 
Um, so usually before I go to bed, I read the gospel for the next day, whatever the mass gospel is. So we're to be like women of the scripture, meditating on the scripture. So we know the word of God, that we're like living in the word of God, being women of the Eucharist. So we're supposed to be, um, you know, brides of the Eucharist. We should have time of adoration. We should have time in mass as much as we can. That's like the basic. And then in silence, Christ in his consecrated virgins, it talks about the main language of the consecrated virgin with her bridegroom is silence. Um, so to be women of silence, we have to learn how to cultivate my friend would call it the cloister of the heart, like the silence with the Lord in the heart, the times of silence. So that's what we do. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, and then I work a normal job, right? So <laughs> I'm working for the church. My job isn't quite always nine to five. Like I have weekend and night events, depending on if we get invited to a school for vocations or a college campus for a retreat weekend, a talk at a parish on a Sunday. Um, so I'm kind of radically available right now to kind of wherever we need to go for the mission of vocation and young adult ministry. We do hiking trips and things like that for young adults, speed dating events. <laughs> this life allows for that flexibility of ministry at various times, really, for me at this point of the journey. So sometimes I'm spending time with discerners out for a coffee or a dinner other times I'm um, meeting up with friends who need my attention and time, some who are in crisis, some who just need a friend. Sometimes God puts situations in my life that I can be attentive to because I have the freedom to do so, right? That availability, radical availability to mission. Availability to National Vocations Fashion Week podcast. That's right. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> All the way on the West Coast. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that's beautiful. Thanks for uh, describing your your spirituality day to day. Thanks for consecrated virgins. Um, with our remaining time left, would you mind giving a word of encouragement to anyone discerning maybe specifically consecrated virginity, but also would you close us in prayer after that? Sure will. Yeah, I think for this vocation of consecrated virginity, um, I think a lot of women out there need a word about being reminded of that scripture passage of having extra oil for the lamp. Um, this vocation is very unpredictable in who's going to be consecrated and when and how long it will take. And so I just offer a word of prayer and encouragement for the women who are just waiting, waiting in various ways, um, waiting for a formation process in their diocese, waiting for a bishop to have openness to, to consecrate women in this vocation. Yeah, there's so many reasons that we wait for readiness to, to actually petition the bishop um, to be ready to do so, to, to have the promptings of the Holy Spirit to do so. So there's so much of learning how to abide in the Lord's timing and his person. And I would also say to let yourself be led by the Holy Spirit in what is the now and in what is that like immediate next? Because sometimes we get excited and we do get ahead of the Lord. Sometimes we are supposed to just abide in the way that he's wooing us um, at the beginning of my journey, just with various scriptures and um, various like light bulb moments where like, oh my gosh, I think I'm called to this. Like you want to go like run and put your petition into the bishop and it's like, no, be still. And and learn what I'm giving you here. Like, just receive my love, learn how to trust me, and learn how to sense these ways that the Holy Spirit is growing you, growing us, um, because he's always growing us. There's always more that we need to be pruned of, that we need to grow in, and to always remain sensitive to the Spirit's movement that way of like, what is the question on my heart right now that's either making me be fearful or... <laughs> making me be joyful and wondering like how to get to that next moment. But like, what am I sensing that the Holy Spirit's doing and help me Lord abide in that and not run ahead of you, but just live this moment of the journey. So learning how to be sensitive there, learn how to have the prayer life with the Lord that you need to hear and abide in him as a bride. Um, it's not about getting to that consecration goal line that would be sad if that was it. Like it's 
as my spiritual director had told me early on, Dawn, you already get to live what you will be thereafter. Just learn, you already are the Lord's. Learn how to live in that well. Learn how to just abide in that life, love journey with him well and be a gift of yourself well. Because what you will be after will look quite similar. You know, don't get disappointed. You, you want to like learn how to live well, the bridal life now, because what you will be after will be just a following and a greater grace in that. So I just offer that as an encouragement to the women out there. And I just will say a prayer for all those in discernment who are watching this. So in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Bless your daughters and also your sons out there who are discerning. I just ask for a special grace for those who are actively discerning the vocation of consecrated virginity in particular for the gift of sensitivity and the life in the spirit. And for that grace to not go ahead of you, Jesus, but to wait for your lead, wait for you to open doors, and also just wait for those moments where you encourage us to do something more, to, to be active in our, in our discernment action steps. And teach us how to love you, Lord, more deeply. And as your church to abide in the sacramental life of our church. But also to be that witness in the world. The glory of your life and presence lived in us. To live that joyfully. Whatever moment we're in of our discernment and vocation journey. We offer surrender of our vocation and our, and our steps of discernment to you, Lord. We pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother, Mother, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Joseph, guardian of virgins, pray for us. Mary, virgin of virgins, pray for us. In the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dawn. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome, Krista. Thank you, too. God bless. With one minute to spare. <laughs> <laughs> we, we did it. That's we perfect. did it. <laughs>